How's it going everybody? So we're back and we're doing a Rift video today and I wanted to go through everything and talk about exactly what's going on and I know a lot of players have been asking for a detailed guide really soon but the thing is I didn't even know what was going on. I mean it just came out. The thing literally just came out. So we're going to start from a beginner standpoint and then we'll work our way up and once we work our way up then we will be ready to actually give you some advice for like Rift 5 and Rift 4 and stuff like that but um, when you guys get to that point in the video where it's pretty much helped you as much as it can for your level then you can feel free to stop watching but I'll, I'll start working my way up so for you beginner level players that have not entered the Rift yet it should say you must uh, do the prerequisite event and that is pretty complicated because it doesn't tell you exactly what to do and don't don't get mad because a lot of people uh, already get annoyed because there's a lot of questions in chat and stuff like that so what you got to do first is you got to clear all the way to Chiruka remains okay you got to beat that on normal on hard on uh, what hell mode yeah it doesn't matter you just got to beat it once so normal mode once you beat it you're fine then you'll unlock these little rift these dimensional rift things that's not rift of worlds it's dimensional rift uh, you can complete normal, you can complete hard, it doesn't matter. You should get dimensional crystals after you complete that. You get three every day. But as long as you just complete it once, then the world boss will actually open, right? Uh, and we actually just finished the boss. It just, uh, you know, died and now it's going to restart in, what, in like 20 minutes. So then you do a damage to the boss. You don't need to wait for it to die. You just need to do some damage to the boss. You enter it, and once it appeared, you go into it. it. You can just put some monsters in. You need at least 10 monsters that are level 30 or above to enter it. At least 10. So don't worry too much if you don't have that yet. Then you can't enter the rift yet. But once you've finished all that, then the rift of worlds will open. Of course, you have a lot of dialogue to go through with Elia, and it can be kind of annoying, but... Once you do all that stuff, you can enter the Rift of Worlds, and you'll notice there are actually six different bosses. And right now, there's only one boss, the other one's still preparing the update, so I'm interested to see what kind of drops those ones will have, and how good they'll be, or hard, you know? Because level 5 on this boss is pretty hard, I can't imagine doing level 5 on another boss that's supposed to be way harder, so... But that should be interesting on what to do. So I already, went, uh, I already did all five levels, um, they're really hard, so... Trust me, if you guys are not prepared for this, this is more end game material. So we'll go through and what exactly does the boss, I think it's like Kizar Kajul, what exactly does he do? So his main attack is actually this Crush of Doom. That's the main one he does. It has no cooldown. And he, there's basically a front line and a back line. I'll show you a little bit of a video here. And what the boss is going to actually do is target that front line mainly, and that's where the most of the damage is going to be. And the more monsters you have on the front line, the more damage it is distributed along that front line. And the more defense you have, the less damage you'll take, that's a given. But for this boss specifically, if you have less defense, then the damage is going to be sub like substantially larger. So high defense monsters like Copper, Ragion, like Golems, uh, or even like the um, uh, Living Armors, I believe, yeah, Living Armors, uh, or just natural 5 stars that have really high base defenses in general. Any monster that has really high base defense, I would say you would at least want around 900 to 1000 defense for your frontline monsters, and I would say anywhere from 2 to 4 it's fine. 2 being the minimum, if you have really, really high defense monsters on the front line, then that's okay. So the next attack that he actually has is called the Breath of Doom. So it basically is just this big giant multi-hit attack, and it's going to attack all of your all six enemies, and it's going to put on the defense break, sorry, no, 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 attack break, uh, attack speed slowness, and then it's going to put Oblivion State, and it's all for two turns. And the Oblivion makes passive skills not work. So running Veramos is pretty difficult, especially if he gets Oblivion on. You got to be very, very careful with this. We'll, we'll talk about this more in a bit. And the harmful effect activation rate increases as the level of the raid increases, obviously. And so I believe it's like uh, 30 or 40 percent around raid four and that's we, we I don't know how a lot of players something with like players lagging out it showed the boss's stats in their like in their spot and people were able to figure out the boss's stats and the boss is extremely fast he's running raid 4 I believe he's running around 184 speed it's it's insane 
the fastest boss I've ever seen by far and it's really nice too because the boss actually has some passive skill that deals damage more the more turns you get in between his attacks so we'll talk more about that later too and so he puts on a lot of debuffs and that's why we're going to want to bring cleanse monsters so cleanse monsters are huge in this raid and I'll talk to you why cleanse might be better than immunity actually uh, so Konamaya, Lisa, or even monsters like Mav that can remove one beneficial or one harmful effect. Uh, just monsters in general that cleanse rather than just, you know, cleanse and immunity. Because the boss actually right here, Rageful Roar, it's becomes enraged whenever an enemy gets a turn and the skill will activate automatically when enraged 16 times. So it's a counter. It counts the amount of turns your monsters get. So Violent Runes isn't actually going to make a difference really it's it will because you'll get more turns but at the same time the counter on um, the little passive skill will just keep going up even if you get violent uh violent attacks revenge runes don't actually do that though so revenge runes are quite nice in this especially if you put it on your nukers so 16 as soon as it hits 16th as soon as your monster is about to go and it counts that 16th turn the mon the boss will go ahead and just steal all of your beneficial effects and then it will do this kind of attack it doesn't really do that much damage but it does remove all of your beneficial effects including the immunity and then it will stun so it will stun and it also the attack power will also increase permanently so that is very 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 dangerous so the more you do this the more you activate this the more like the stronger he gets that's why having monsters where you're going a lot it's pretty dangerous and that's why speed teams are more about damage rather than about the amount of turns you get that's also why running monsters that increase your attack bar can be pretty dangerous if you can't actually tank that damage so having monsters that only do that kind of stuff can be quite quite risky so just be careful about that and again we're still still talking kind of one through three which they did nerf a little bit so you don't have to worry about that so much so then this is the next skill is actually uh, a skill that activates three times in the match only three times so whenever the boss's HP goes by down by 25% it will basically do this giant flying maneuver where it attacks all the enemies and it puts on it removes all of the harmful effects on itself and then it'll put a bunch of uh, harmful I don't think it actually does harmful effects no 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 but it is basically a um, just a big giant flying maneuver and it does do substantial damage towards the end of the match so it'll activate at 75% at 50% and then at 25% HP and you have to be very very careful because he could do a three hit wombo combo uh, and basically what that means is if you look at the end part of it it says crush of doom and breath of doom will gain an additional hit whenever total annihilation is activated so if his little counter is up at like 15 and the, or like 14 and then he is does his little flying attack he removes all of his harmful effects the attack break the glancing hit all of those things that you put on him that makes him not do as much damage those are all gone and then as soon as you get ready that that skill will go ahead and activate and if his attack bar is high enough then he'll go ahead and attack again so that counter one doesn't actually use up his attack bar but his actual skill does and then his flying attack will just absolutely destroy you so you have to be very very careful and the way it works is it it does rely a little bit on RNG but you need to get a team going two other teammates because it does bring three teammates in and if you're not careful with the teammates you bring if you don't do enough damage then the attack power will just get way too large and he'll just wipe your entire you know team if you do too much damage and you're not focused on surviving you'll get down to around 10 20 percent and you'll seem really close and it's like wow we're so close to beating it but in reality it's just it's going to wipe the floor with you because if you don't have sustainability then you're pretty much screwed so then we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and look at some of the passive skills so when the boss eliminates an entire team of monsters the boss's attack speed will increase and will start attacking all of the nearby enemies so basically what this means is the head uh, is attacking a certain player there's three different heads attacking three different players each with six monsters and if one team dies from one player that the head that was attacking that player will gain an attack speed increase and that is very very bad now having an additional head isn't too bad but the only problem is the attack speed of the entire boss okay not just the head but I'm pretty sure it's the entire boss it increases 
and that is pretty dangerous. It, it basically means that you're going to be getting more hits off on your team, which is hard because I, I say without attack break or even just when you're down towards 20% HP, when you do lose monsters, you probably take about half of your team's HP on the front line from one boss attack. Let's say your boss gets a second attack off without you know you being able to heal, you're going to be wiped. So as long as you have attack break on though, then he won't do more than half of your team's damage. But he will do, I'd say, at least half of the team's damage if you do not have attack break on towards the end of the boss's health. So very dangerous again. The damage of the next attack will increase in proportion to the number of the enemy's turns. So basically what this means is there's also a counter on the left side. So this is a different counter. This is like uh, basically the boss really does damage uh, and counter moves in proportionate to the amount of turns you get. So that little 16 counter will not reset when you, you know, when the boss gets a turn. It will just keep going every time. So once it hits 16, it will reset. But the one on the left, which is this Destroyer's Revenge, will actually reset when the boss gets a turn. So let's say you run Verta Hill, like a huge speed team that you run for like dragons or something like that. So you run Verta Hill, Bernard, or Ryan, or stuff like that, where you just get a shit ton of, uh, of turns. Then you're going to probably get this little counter way up there, and then his attack power will get much larger. So this is why I advise against bringing Verta Hill into it because he doesn't really add any debuffs and on top of that he's going to make your team go a lot more often which is not necessarily a good thing in terms of this passive skill. You definitely want to get a lot of turns in but you just really want to be careful. So if you're going to be activating a lot of turns on this Destroyer's Revenge you're probably going to take a lot more damage than the other teams that they're having so it's probably a good idea to mainly focus on the debuffs you put on the boss rather than focusing on the buffs that you put on yourself because those will be stripped every 16 turns. And lastly, this passive skill is just basically on the mechanics of the boss. So the way the boss works is there's three separate heads, each attacking a separate team, but the thing is they don't have the same attack gauge. So each head has their own separate attack gauge that increases you know, by itself. So if you do have debuffs though, however, so the debuffs actually do share amongst all three heads so it'll be right in the middle and it will just apply to every single head but here's something that probably not a lot of you know the way the debuffs are actually counted so say there's three turns how do you determine when it's two turns left or one turn left well the player that applied the debuffs their head is the one that determines when it will be removed so say i apply two turns of defense break and then my my boss gets one turn while everyone else's gets like two turns well it's actually going to be one turn left on the defense break because my boss uh, still hasn't moved two times he only moved one time and it took me a little bit of time to figure this out and I know a lot of players probably have figured this out as well but a lot of you guys haven't seen this as well and a lot of players probably haven't really thought of it and this is probably this is really actually important because you need to get a team together to coordinate what attacks and debuffs you're going to be putting on the boss and this is a huge thing because debuffs are what make it or break it and that's the reason we were able to get to level 5 so quickly now level 5 is on another level it is extremely hard and there's no way for myself to farm it or other players I think we're gonna be needing to definitely build teams specifically for Rift 5 but for things like 3 and 4, you can do make with makeshift monsters. The main idea is building a team that can heal you when you get really low. So I would definitely suggest at least bringing 2 or 3 healers. Definitely bring some kind of cleanser. If the cleanser also so, uh, you know goes as a heal, like Konamaya or Delphoi, then that definitely works as well. But it, it's towards the end of the raid that you'll definitely see that he will start really, really laying down damage. So I will go ahead and show you some footage again and just talking about the way that the boss works. You really want to put on as many debuffs. I'd say the most important debuffs, there's three of them, and that's attack break, defense break, and slow in the speed. Glancing hit is probably not as important, but I would say glancing hit has made huge differences for my runs. I definitely the the slow decreasing helps a lot as well. So bringing monsters like Hua, who have pretty much hybrid damage, where you can build them pretty tanky, who can also deal some really nice damage, especially with her passive skill where she moves multiple times. 
that those kinds of monsters are really nice but if you're looking for monsters that you really want to farm especially for some players that don't exactly have the right summons here are a few monsters that you might want to look at especially because these monsters i have found just super useful in the raid so i'll go through i'll point out which ones are not farmable that are useful and which ones are farmable and useful so going through this theo mars is pretty good in this raid because he can be pretty tanky so as you know his third skill or sorry his passive skill allows him to have pretty much a second chance but and of course that's obtainable uh, obtainable through the ifrit pieces uh, orion very nice because he has a three turn uh, heal block and defense break on two skills and he has violent procs on his first skill Again, you have to be very careful. He does tend to violent proc a lot on his first skill, so that can really harm you, especially when you're in higher higher up stages, because if you're not careful, he could get that little left counter way up there, and the boss will do a lot of damage to you. Praha, I know, guys, just bear with me. These are non-farmable units. I'll, I'll go through some farmable uh, farmable units, and so just, just keep going. This is for players that do have them. If you do have them, I'm just going to go through everything. Braha resist leader super super useful okay and um, going going just down the list Chloe can be okay for rift one through three it just you have to be very careful because that's two extra debuffs if the boss catches you off guard that you could really get screwed on Hua very useful monster you know I I think Hua is one of the more useful monsters in this raid just because she allows you to attack more again you have to build a team around this because you don't want to take too much damage from it but allows you to do hybrid damage and slow down the boss speed and also decrease the attack bar lisa is one of my favorites i have to ruin her up for a rift I'm, i plan on using her she puts on glancing hit so she allows you to replace chasun because i'm not a huge fan for chasun in the raid just because her aoe heal which is basically what you want mostly you want aoe healing um, it's not the best and I find Colleen to be better for this raid especially with her kit just, That's just my personal opinion. You know a lot of people have different opinions I think you know Chisun's a great monster But I just don't think she's good for this rift as much as some of her other you know possibilities So I think Lisa is a great alternative to the glancing hit and she brings this cleanse with you That allows three randomly selected allies to attack on an enemy target Which also reduces those three enemies the cooldown of that of those monsters so it's basically using the first skill of three random monsters, but it basically counts as their turn, but it doesn't reset the attack bar, so that, that cooldown does go down. Uh, Brian, very, very good kit. He, he uh, disturbs the HP recovery, so he's got heal block, attack break, and revive, so again, very, very good monster. You really want to look at all three skills being able to be used. Bernard is an also amazing monster for this raid. Now you'd think, oh, okay, well he's got this attack speed increase, you know, and he's also got the attack bar boost, which is why he's good. Well, he's that's good too, but the main thing he's good for is really his second skill. Look, Take a look at his second skill. It's attack power decrease and defense decrease. So basically the attack break and the defense break, but look at that cooldown. Two turns. Basically what that means is he's going to be getting this second skill off if he uses his AI right every other turn this is going to be available every other turn at least that is so nice because you can immediately start putting down more damage and decrease the boss's de uh, the boss's attack power which is why i always choose bernard and this is why i'm going to be talking about B bernard versus mav and a, a few players would probably disagree with me on why i would choose bernard over mav but basically the main thing is not a lot of players are running colleen yet uh, mainly, I'm sorry, I'm talking about mid-level players. A lot of higher-level players have already six starter, but mainly because she's such an amazing monster. But not a lot of people have built necro teams, which is where she shines mostly. And she basically decreases the attack power. Uh, she has heal block, and she's got this uh, attack power increase and the heal, which is pretty similar to Belladion's recovery. It's pr it's around what 29% summon around there. Yeah, it's about 29% or sorry 30 percent yeah 30 percent so it's pretty similar to bella Dion's heal and the kit that she brings is really nice so colleen is another monster i would really highly recommend which is farmable vigor is also farmable increases the attack speed and heals and does pretty nice damage and puts on heal block and defense break another great monster this is also a great monster because he mainly uses his first skill the second skill he does use every now and then which doesn't really do much does decent damage can reflect damage on his passive skill and he will also put on a ton of heal block and defense break but i would not suggest using joltan as much for heal block mainly because 
it's only one turn and it doesn't really make that much of a difference and the defense break he does bring is two turns but again it's just oh sorry it's one turn oh, okay so yeah so you have to be very careful with Joel Tan because he can be good but at the same time uh, I would say some of the other like like bringing Colleen would just be a lot better of a choice and the reason that Vigor or Escher even Escher would be a better choice than Joltan is just because they bring the heal and the attack speed increase, uh, not just the, the heal block, you know? And they do bring damage too. I like Fagor over Escher just because he brings the... He does less attacks, um, but he does bring the defense break that applies. Uh, another great option is Darian, who will have a problem with the Oblivion, so you gotta be really careful with that Oblivion. It will, dis uh, it will disable his passive, but if you can get that off with a cleanser or something, this will help you definitely survive a lot of damage on that front line because it does reduce damage by 15%. Again, farmable, and he brings attack break and defense break. Again, another great kit. Bringing monsters, oops, bringing monsters like uh, Ragion or even like Copper on the front line to absorb a lot of the damage. Really high defense monsters. I'm just starting to build mine. Um, those are really great options as well. Delphoi is a great immunity monster. I'll, I'll talk about some options. So let me pull up a list here. I'll go through a lot of good farmable monsters. So Colleen, definitely something you would want to look at. Uh, golems, any of the golems that really can self-buff. Great options for frontline monsters. They deal decent damage, okay? Be very careful with bringing monsters like this that put on like three different buffs. Those will get removed, especially if they last for a while. And it will just heal up the boss unless you got heal block. And the boss will definitely just absolutely destroy so be very careful with those kinds of monsters um so going through i would say it, it's hard to go through every single monster but i would say the monsters you should really focus on are ones that synergize well so you look at monsters like colleen and you notice how none of her skills are wasted all right so her first skill does something it puts on the attack break her second skill puts on the heal block her third skill buffs up your team and heals them she has no skill wasted, and the cooldowns are so low that it's it just absolutely amazing, okay? So you definitely want to look at uh, teams like that and monsters that really bring kits that will never be wasted. Chisun is no skill wasted. She's got glancing hit, heal, and heal, and she buffs on her second one. So Chisun is a great option as well. So if you don't have a lot of healers, definitely Chisun is a great healer to bring. You really want to look at resist leader. The two main resistance leaders right now are Praha, of course, not a lot of players have her, but another one that a lot of players do have that works universal is Tessarian. Yep, same resistance leader as Praha, in case you guys didn't know that. So Tessarian, if you have Tessarian, a lot of players will love you if you run that resistance leader. And why is the resistance leader so important, which is why we're going to get into this specific topic, is actually what do you use for leader skills? Leader skills are actually shared amongst your team, like the every single team. So if I bring a speed leader and someone else brings a crit rate leader, both of our leader skills will be applied to each other. It'll be applied to all three players, okay? So that's why you gotta coordinate and talk about which different leader skills and stuff like that you want to bring. So I'd say the three best ones to bring are a really high resistance leader skill like Praha's or Tessarian's, uh, where it's 40%, 41%. Uh, even bringing one that's like 30% is okay, so like bringing something like Iona is, is okay, but you wanna look for someone with Tessarian. That's the easiest monster to get for this. Uh, you wanna bring a speed leader if you can, so having like Jemire or even some kind of speed leader that can apply to the raid, universal. So if your damage is like Shimate or something like that, then uh, I guess that's okay. But you really want to look for someone that's going to be a good use inside the raid. That's why I say Jemire is probably a lot better for that role. Um, if not, run an HP leader. And then the last spot should always be a defense leader. You should at least have one universal defense leader in your party if you're not running solo like mono teams like mono attribute so i mean like all fire or all win on the front line which is another strategy that you can actually use you can actually use a like a mono leader skill like this where it's just for win attribute and then you run a full wind front line that that also works as well but again you want to stay away from trying to boost up your hp a lot and you want to start trying to boost up your defense a lot and that's why a lot of teams you see uh will actually use like like right here mav defense okay i'm running speed hp defense 
running defense is also a lot more viable now in the game. It used to not be as viable. Now, I know this is getting kind of a long video, but I just wanted to really talk about it and really get in-depth as much as possible, and that's basically what you want to focus on, the debuffs. You want to get a team that can survive well and have a few tanky DPS that can actually buff your team as well, like having like a Vigor, or even bringing something like Darien, uh, or even like Ragion and Copper. So those kinds of tanky DPS will allow you to boost up that uh, percentage of damage that you really do, but you'll also want to bring a main damager, so having like a damage-based Hua, having like Theo Mars, or even like Akamir. Akamir, or Akamamir, does a lot of damage in this. He probably does, um, I'd say mine does like 15k per hit on his third skill when we get a ton of debuffs off. But the boss also has a lot of defense, so be careful with that. So your damage on the units won't be as much as it will on like Arena and stuff like that. So keep that in mind. Now, this is the last thing I want to put out there. Using passive skills, be very careful with the, the Oblivion. I know I told you guys this already, but bringing stuff like Veramos and Darien, uh, or even stuff like Theomars, it's risky. It is risky, and you're going to need a cleanser. So bringing, a, like, Konamaya, uh, some kind of cleanser, there's no question about it. You need a cleanser. That's, that's my two cents on it. I'm going to be building up Lisa as my cleanser. I don't like the immunity too much because it gets it removed anyways, and the cooldown on it is so much more. So I'm going to be building up a Konamaya. Lisa would be nice because it's the same amount as Delphoi, but at least it allows my units to get cooldown, and it brings up Glancing Hit so I can start bringing in Colleen instead of Chasun. So that's that's my idea on it. If you guys uh, definitely got help from this guide, leave a like. I really appreciate it. If you guys have any questions, again, just leave it in the comment section below. My goal in this video was just kind of give you a few tips and pointers and also tell you a few things that not a lot of players know about the boss and one of the main things is that the boss is incredibly fast and you have to be prepared for it the damage is split up into many hits so the damage is probably about 700 per hit which is like nothing but then the boss hits like 10 times in a row so he'll just like like you you see verta hill how he has a two hit on his second skill the boss has like a 10 hit on his skill so it does a lot of damage but just split up a lot so he will hit you many 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 times so that being said the debuffs will land it's not like you just resist it you resist his attack and it resists all the debuffs he hits many times so there's plenty of chance for all of those debuffs to apply and they will apply and that's why resistance leaders are really important okay Last thing I'll leave you guys with, always check the leader skill. If it says it's not available in Universal, it's not available in Rift. Rift does not count as dungeons. So like Vertihill leader skill does not work. Uh, bringing stuff like Shihua, where it's like to attributes, those work. So like Bernard skill also works, wind attribute, okay? So attribute skills, leader skills, those work. And then Universal skills like this one, like just plain out resistance or like plain out attack power those work as well but if it says dungeons if it says arena uh, or guild war they will not work for the raid all right guys hope you guys enjoyed the video and i hope it helped you out and i will see you guys in the next episode stay tuned for the next farmer fill it will come out as soon as i finish finals i know you guys have been asking a lot of times and i've been answering in the comments only but this is my official answer to it i'm just a lot studying and just doing this video it takes a lot of time out and you probably notice it's not a lot of editing so that's why i'm doing it and yeah just be patient farmer fill will come out soon one last thing guys i gotta give a huge shout out to conbra and childish plays for helping me out doing rift 3 and uh, just you know super helpful and able to show the units that I showed in this video in case you guys are you know watching the actual playthrough of the rift so uh, big shout out to them I'll put a link to childish plays channel down in the description below he does have a YouTube channel he does do summoner war videos so if you guys want to check that out feel free to check that out also I'm thinking about doing a new logo and slash or some actual t-shirts for the reefy community all right so if you guys have any ideas or if you guys definitely want to do that i'll put down a comment below so just leave a like on the comment if you guys would love to see that kind of stuff and uh who knows maybe i'll include it in the giveaway do some free t-shirt stuff so you guys let me know what you think and i will see you guys in the next episode stay awesome guys incredible i honestly think this is going to be one of the best updates uh since they added trial of ascension because i remember when they added that and that was amazing so, let's go through and read it, and then I'll explain different things about it. You know, a lot of you more mid-game to, you know, 
end game players are going to benefit from this more. Uh, you players that are a little bit lower level probably won't be able to do this yet, so you probably won't see Farmer Fail doing these raids yet, but this should be fun, so let's go.